Welcome to the special edition of the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Hall, here with Joel Saxon. And our guest today is David Burton. David is a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright, which is based in New York. David is an expert in U.S. tax matters and has experience with structuring tax-efficient transactions for renewable operations. David was a managing director and senior tax counsel at GE Energy Financial Services, where he oversaw all the tax aspects for more than $21 billion in global energy products. David, welcome to the program. Thank you, Alan. It's great to be here. Okay, so the timing of this could not be better. And Joel and I were just up in Canada trying to explain to the Canadians what the IRA bill meant and why everybody is so confused as to what is happening in America. So we thought we'd bring in the expert to help us with understanding the all the tax incentives that are built, in, built up into the IRA bill. And I, I want to give you a couple of softballs to start with. How about that? Production, production tax credit. What is that in the IRA bill? And what does that mean? It's $27.50 per megawatt hour for the first 10 years of production. Um, if you transfer the project, the transferee steps into your shoes and does not get to restart the 10-year period. Um, it's a pretty powerful tax credit. Uh, to get the $27.50 a megawatt hour, there are uh, uh, requirements you have to meet um, that we call the fine print that regard um, prevailing wage and apprentice requirements, which we can get into. That makes sense to me. That's a really good explanation. I have not heard explained that simply. That one's easy. I like that one. I can follow that. All right. Investment tax credits. Let's raise the, raise the heat up a little bit. What is an in investment tax credit? The base uh, percentage for the investment tax credit is 30%. Again, you have to comply with prevailing wage and apprentice to even get to 30%. Um, and, it's, and it's a tax credit that accrues when the project is placed in service, basically operational. Um, and it's 30% of a tax basis, which you know more or less is 30% of the cost of the project. Um, rather than having to wait 10 years, you get, all, you get the tax benefit all up front. So uh, oftentimes uh, the, the PTC may be a bigger gross amount, uh, but it's over 10 years. So sometimes you'll, you're gonna opt for the ITC because it's a better present value answer, but it's just a question of math. I want to touch one important thing here, and this is an important thing that I got from you, David, when we originally talked that I did not know, and it's and it's huge for the tax code and huge for these these uh, uh, all of this credits. You can only pick one. You do not get to choose an ITC for some stuff or like for on a project for a little bit of this, a little of that, and then some PTC here and there. It's like you either go PTC or you go ITC, and you got to do the math to figure out which one you want to choose. Okay, now. Let's understand the little nuances here and what they apply to, because I'm not sure which one of which of these protection or investment tax credits these apply to. Domestic content, which seems to be a large part of the IRA bill, uh, and it seems to be oriented towards American steel and iron because most of a wind turbine is made out of steel. What is the domestic content requirement, and what does that mean if I'm a company or an operator or a developer trying to apply it? Well, first of all, it's, it's not a requirement. It's, it's what we call an adder. Um, so it's a 10% a adder. Um, and so for uh, the ITC, it's 10 percentage points. So it would take you from 30 to 40. For the PTC, it's 10%. So it's 2750 times 110%. You know, so it's about uh, twenty nine dollars and change in uh, in tax credit. So, so it's additional opportunity for a bigger tax credit. But you could build your project with you know all Asian components and steel and still qualify for the base credit. It's just an upside if you qualify for it. And how do you show that you have the proper amount of domestic content? How does that work when a uh, wind generator, the, the generator itself, the generator is made from parts from all over the world, typically. Do you have to go all the way down into a, the component level to, to determine what percentage of this thing, this generator, is made in America? Yes, but it, it's even more complicated than that. So the, the domestic content rules were written about as complicated as they could be and about as unuser friendly as they could be. Uh, you know, the industry has commented heavily and is lobbying for them to be, you know, simplified or improved. Uh, the U.S. Treasury may or may not be inclined to do that. Um, so the first requirement is relatively straightforward, which is that structural components um, have to be made out of uh, U.S. steel and U.S. iron. So 
rebar in foundations has to be, you know, U.S. steel um, and, and has to be 100 percent. You can't say, oh, I'm mostly U.S. steel, but I've got a little bit of Korean steel has to be all U.S. steel. So that's the first requirement. And so that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle is that the manufactured components have to be 40 percent U.S. Um, and that percentage will escalate over time. But it's currently 40 percent U.S. And what they did to avoid gamesmanship, but to make it very hard on the industry, um, but they're really focused on gamesmanship, is they said they were going to measure that 40% using the manufacturer's direct cost, which is U.S. tax speak for the manufacturer's uh, labor and materials, right? So they didn't want people selling stuff at hyped prices or, you know, playing games. They said, okay, the most basic measure we can get to is, well, what did it cost to manufacture and labor materials to make this component? And that's what we're going to test for uh, um, domestic content. And of those components, you need 40%. Now, if you have any um, imported subcomponent, uh, uh, unfortunately, of certain subcomponents, unfortunately, you don't get to count your assembly cost. So even if you are assembling uh, the component in Colorado, in the United States, if you have subcomponents in that component, certain subcomponents that are imported, you don't get to qualify. And, and that was more about solar. I'll just give you quickly on that. That was really trying to ensure that uh, solar cells uh, are manufactured in the United States. So Treasury was concerned that people were going to build solar module factories and just assemble the modules here, but not make the cells here where the real technology is. So they said, OK, if you do that, you don't get to count your assembly costs. You have to count that as imported, even though it's workers in Colorado putting it together. Uh, so that's why they made it kind of onerous. And similar concepts apply to wind components. Treasury put out a notice that for onshore, offshore winds, uh, utility scale solar storage tells us, you know, how far you have to drill down for each component. It's a tough thing here for me to understand. And, and we talked about this a little bit before is the, the these these percentage rules are going to be based on labor and materials. But what, at what level of success do you think anybody's going to get their their vendor to give up their actual goods costs uh, to, and basically show what their profit margins are to their clients to get these credits? Yeah, so far, there's not been a whole lot of success in that. Some manufacturers are saying they'll disclose to an accounting firm on a confidential basis when the accounting firm can write you a generic memo you know, that says, doesn't give you the cost, but says we've looked at it and you meet the 40% test, uh, you know, and we're accounting terms of trust us. Uh, so that's another approach people are taking. But you need not to, but you also need to, to know what goes in the denominator of this fraction. You also need to know the imported direct costs. So you need to go to Japan and Korea and China and say, hey, look, I didn't pay you any premium for this. You know, I'm not giving you anything for this, but would you just tell me, you know, what your profit margin is so I can put this in my denominator? And then those companies are obviously like, well, you didn't pay me anything more. I never promised you this. I'm not doing it. Um, you can get around that by just saying, okay, I'll use my own costs. So I use like my retail costs and I'll put that in the denominator. But you have to have a lot of headroom, you know, uh, in the fraction for that to work. If you're right at, you know, 40.5% and then you put in your, uh, your retail costs, it, you know, it's going to be, you're going to fall under it. So you'd have to have headroom for that to work. So that's the, you know, that's the other challenge is having to ask your, foreign suppliers for their direct costs and they got nothing out of it. Right. So, yeah, we're wading into the weeds now. Yeah. Okay. So, but, but, but I think that's a really valuable thing to know at the moment because it does, there's a lot of talk about domestic content, but when you get down to the realities of somebody trying to figure it out, and it's probably a room full of people trying to figure it out, it's not as easy as it was, it seems. And I, 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 we're going to keep driving deeper and in, in putting the heat on here as we go. What is low-income community Indian land incentives? What is that as part of the IRA bill, and why does it matter? I'm not sure it does matter that much for your uh, viewers. Uh, you have for two reasons. First reason is you have to be under five megawatts of capacity to even qualify for that. So I, I you know, I, I get the sense, you know, most of your viewers are utility scale players. So you know, they're they're not even going to qualify. So then let's say, let's say you are under five megawatts capacity and you meet this low income or Indian lands requirement. You then have the right to apply to the Department of Energy 
um, and the Department of Energy uh, will review your application and rank your application against all the other applications and make a recommendation to the IRS as to which uh, project should be granted an allocation. So most of these credits, you just claim on your tax return. If you qualify, you qualify. This one is competitive, right? So there's a limited amount per uh, IRS and DOE to allocate, and it's a competitive process to apply for it. Um, so, you know, even if you're serving low-income Indians on brownfields, you know, um, if you don't, uh, uh, if you don't get the allocation, you don't, you don't qualify for it. And, you know, there may be a project that's, you know, more compelling to the Department of Energy that they rank higher. They prefer projects that are further along, right? So the further along your project are, the more likely it is to be built, the higher that they rank it. It's one of the components, but they don't want you to place the project in service until they give you the allocation. So you can end up in kind of suspended animation whereby, yeah, like my project's really far along. I'm definitely building it. Uh, please give me the allocation. You haven't given me the allocation yet. Okay, I'm just stopping everything. You know, I'm just going to continue to pay on my construction loan, you know, continue to pay my ground lease, my insurance. I'll just stop everything, not have any revenue, and wait for you, Department of Energy, to decide whether I do or do not qualify. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, practical issues with it. But again, it's it, Five megawatts and below, so not not an issue for the utility scale market. You touched on brownfields, and the brownfield uh, condition and then incentives around brownfields came up in a discussion from Orsted, of all people. Orsted was going to use it in, I think it was Sunrise uh, Wind Farm, at the, where they were planning to run the cable onto the on, on land in New York uh, was a brownfield location. Well, the soil sampling they have done indicates it, it would be brownfield. And uh, so therefore they could apply for, I think it was up to 10%. Uh, and does, so for basically running a cable through a, a plot of land, probably not even that big of a plot of a land, they get a bump up of 10%. Does, is that just the generic rules around it? Like if you run into a brownfield in any part of your project that there's a 10% bump up in the in the payment brownfield is one of the energy uh community uh criteria or definitions um that is a 10 percent bump uh again 30 to 40 or 110 percent of 2750 um both itc and ptc qualify um you don't have to apply for it you just have to put it on your tax return and get comfortable that you meet the definition and be ready to be audited if the irs opts to audit you um the, the, that that rule is for offshore wind, right? So, you know, they, they said, okay, we want offshore wind to be able to qualify for this, but uh, brown fields and something in the middle of the ocean are kind of, uh, you know, inconsistent, right? Not very common. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they said, okay. They said, okay, you know, you look at, you, 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 you apply this by looking at the uh, uh, census track, you know, closest to where your project is. So that's what Orsted saying is that, you know, they're building the project offshore of a brownfield, and so they think they should qualify. And that is, you know, in fact, you know, what the, what the rule says. Uh, but, it, but it's not like you can build a project in Nebraska and run a cable, you know, through a, you know, a toxic waste dump and say, oh, I qualify. You know, it's worth a try at this point. But OK, so for our listeners that are not based in the United States, a uh, brownfield is a site that has been contaminated, not to the point where it's not inhabitable. But there's contamination in the soil that need to be reclamated, I guess. Uh, and w when that happens, uh, it has limited uses after that has occurred. So my guess in this particular case with Orsted, that they would be forced to clean up the area in which they're using or next to. So it sounds like Orsted had done some soil drilling uh, and sampling. So it sounds like they were talking about some sort of cleanup there. Uh, but... Uh, it it sounds like a landing cable. It's what it sounded like to me. An export cable? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in the United States, in that, in that particular condition, they're going to give you a bonus for using the land that has been contaminated for another purpose. And putting a cable through it is a really good uh, concept, right? Because it's this doesn't involve any people being on it, but it's still useful land. So there's the incentive. Now, okay, so <laughs> that's the foundation. In wind, where are operators, developers going at the moment? Are they headed towards PTC? or ITC for the most part, or what, what's your feeling on that? So the, the, the rule of thumb, and it's just a rule of thumb, it's not 100% true, is that onshore wind is PTC and offshore wind is ITC. And that's because onshore wind is 
relatively low cost of all the improvements in the technology and the construction and the efficiency, much higher efficiency than it used to be. The capacity factors have gone up. Um, and therefore, you do the present value of the 10 years of PTCs and you say, OK, that's greater than 30 percent. The map tells me I want PTC. Uh, offshore wind, it's obviously very expensive to build because you're constructing it in the ocean and you've got all those challenges and very expensive equipment and you got to transport it all out to the middle of the ocean and there's limited number of vessels that can do that and all those good stuff, right? Um, so for, for um, offshore wind, it tends to be that it's so expensive that the ITC is the better option um, and that that's what the sponsors are planning to claim. Uh, but on a project by project basis, it could be a different answer. Okay. So on offshore, if they're going for ITC, that then affects what they're asking for in terms of uh, purchase price agreements, the PPAs, right? So on onshore, it's the prices are sort of PPA plus PTC. That's that's how they tend to look at the, the business case, right? Right. So on offshore, then it's ITC plus tends to be larger PPAs because, like you're explaining, it's a sort of a difficult environment. Okay, that explains a lot about what's happening with the developers off the coast of New York at the moment. Now, what are energy tax credit transfers? And Joel and I have seen a number of big press releases about this energy tax credit transfers and how there's a new financial instrument to transfer future uh, PTC uh, to, uh, uh, to, or, or to buy, to swap that for, for current value? Is that present value? Is, is that what it is? And there's a commu there's a communication kind of guff there. And I think in the industry, cause a lot of people are reading this, not having an economic or legal mind and they see like tax equity financing and PTC swaps and, and everybody kind of assumes it's all the same thing. That's all, oh, that's just how they finance the project, but nobody knows, or, or I'm not gonna say nobody knows, but a lot of people are they just kind of blank it over it and they go, yeah, 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 they're financing the project that way. But can you give us an outline of the difference between tax equity financing and, and people actually selling the PTC revenue and some of these things that we're seeing in the news? Sure, sure. So for 100 years, the U.S. federal income tax law said you cannot sell tax credits. And, and when you did a, a structured kind of cutting edge transaction, what you would worry about is that the IRS would come in and say, nope. Uh, that's not an equity investment. That's actually a sale of tax credits. Uh, you're not allowed to sell tax credits. You lose, right? And that was the that was the law of the United States for 100 years, right? Um, in the in and that and that led to tax equity, uh, whereby through partnerships and sometimes leases, uh, we were able to transfer much of the tax credits to a relatively passive financial investor who contributed cash up front uh, in exchange for being allocated those tax credits. But it was it's still a pretty complicated transaction. You still have to deal with hundreds of pages of documentation. You still have to take some project finance operational risk. Um, it's still an ongoing investment. Uh, you know, it's a multi-year, very long investment. Um, and so there was a, there was a limited uh, universe of tax equity investors. And it tended to be Big banks, some insurance companies, some corporates like GE and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, but you know, really, kind of the most sophisticated, um, uh, go-getting kind of uh, 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 public companies out there that had teams of people, uh, lawyers, accountants, engineers, uh, underwriters, figuring out this stuff. And many companies were just like, "Yeah, that's not our core business. We don't want to learn project finance. We don't want to learn any more tax law." We don't want to read 300 pages of documents. You know, we know it's profitable, but not for us, right? Um, so there was a limited universe. So then Congress said, we're going to subsidize uh, our clean energy and the deal with climate change through the tax code, but there's not enough tax equity investors to monetize all these tax credits. We need something else. The first proposal was what we now, what's called direct pay, whereby you could just go to the IRS and say, I qualify for these tax credits, but I don't owe any tax. Um, please cut me a check, you know, 100 cents of a dollar for these tax credits. Senator Manchin and others said, oh, that's too much government involvement. We don't want the government playing that role. We think this should be more private sector driven. So to get Senator Manchin's, you know, tie-breaking vote on board, they said, okay, we will shift 
towards transferability, whereby the credits can be sold um, to corporations, uh, banks, insurance companies, et cetera, uh, for cash and just a simple sale. So it, it's, it's, you know, you call it a financial instrument. That's a little bit of an overstatement. It's really just a bill of sale, right? It, it, it's not that different than the bill of sale you use to buy and sell a car, you know? So you want to go buy a new Ford, it's a bill of sale, right? It's the same kind of thing. All right? Now it is, it is, you know, tens of pages of documents as opposed to 300, so maybe 20, 30 pages of documents. Um, so it's more than a bill of sale for a Ford, but that, that's basically, you know, that's basically what it is. It's not a, not a lease. It's not a partnership. It, it, you know, it's just a, a purchase and sale agreement. Um, and it, and it's, and it's cash in exchange for tax credits. You don't have any equity investment in the project. You're not a member of the project. You're not voting on whether or not to, you know, uh, buy a new inverter. You're, you're not paying the property taxes. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're just buying the tax credits, extremely passive. Um, and we are seeing the market for that uh, expand from the traditional tax equity investors. We are seeing parties who, you know, um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, entertainment companies, retailers who pay a lot of tax have a you know savvy treasury and tax department saying, yeah, like we'd rather pay 90 cents of a dollar than 100 cents of a dollar for our taxes. We don't have to have an ongoing investment. We don't have to invest equity. We don't have to deal with complicated accounting issues. You know, let's let's do this. We are seeing it expand. Uh, but again, everybody wants to wants a profit, right? So no one, you know, nobody's gonna pay a hundred cents of a dollar. So it actually means that it costs the US Treasury the same amount. It's still a dollar of tax credit, but the developer's only putting, you know, whatever, 90 cents in its pocket. While if they did direct pay, which they don't qualify for mostly, they they get a they get a hundred cents of a dollar. So Mansion is taking you know, 10 cents away from a developer to put it into new projects and giving it to these corporations buying the tax credits, which, you know, uh, is work for me. And I, I don't complain about it, but I'm not sure it's the right, you know, the ideal policy from a climate change perspective. Yeah, because I mean, the companies that do this are engaged within that trade, uh, basically market. They could take that capital, they get up front, say a developer gets some cash up front for their future PTC funds. In the grand scheme of things, they could take that money and invest it offshore. If they wanted to, right? It could be a like a like a, a CIP COP type where they're doing some work here, yes, but they have a large uh, portfolio in Taiwan or offshore Japan or something like that. And that money, that's a tax benefit within the states, could actually be used to spur on renewable energy transition offshore or elsewhere. Well, it, it's not so easy to get the money out of the U.S. without triggering withholding tax. So, I mean, it, you know, that the, the U.S. tax law does, you know, <laughs> is savvy about that. So. I'm not terribly concerned about the proceeds going to develop, you know, offshore wind in Japan, um, you know, and uh, so so that, you know, that that's not not not, not such an easy thing to do. Um, they're more likely to leave the money here. You know, there, there's one other thing I wanted to t kind of touch on here from from a, a competitive versus non-competitive standpoint. Now, we talked PTC, we talked ITC, but there are other things in the IRA bill that we've we spoke about offline, and one of them being the uh, 45X and 48C, and then the idea that some of these are competitive, some of them are non-competitive. Can you touch on that a little bit? Sure. So 45X and 48C are both to stimulate manufacturing of energy components, right? So they're not for projects. They're not for you know the uh, you know Nebraska Wind ABC project, right? It's uh, uh, it's for a factory, right? It's for a factory. Building a vessel or something like that. Maybe building a vessel. Uh, so 48C, it's kind of broad. Uh, DOE has some discretion as to how they grant it. 48C is an investment tax credit again, right? So it's money up front, uh, a, a percentage of your cost. Um, and, and it does qualify for some of the adders, not all the adders, but some of the adders. Um, and uh, it's competitive. So you have to apply to the Department of Energy um, there's a limit as to how much the Department of Energy can allocate. Congress put a cap on in 48C, um, and the Department of Energy is, is, has been accepting applications, is reviewing them, and will rank them, and then you know allocate based on how much capacity they have going down their list, giving it to what they perceive to be the best projects. Um, and what they think of as the best project is kind of similar to what you said before. Both you know impact on climate change or importance for like a, a climate change, but also the likelihood of it getting built. Right. You could have like some genius solution, you know, that you're going to build a new widget. But if there's a one chance in a thousand, you know, it actually gets built. The OE is probably not going to want to fund it because they're going to say we'd rather have something more likely. Um, so. Right. 
So that so that's that's 48C, and then there's 45X. So you can't do both. It, it's either or. 45X uh, is a production credit based on um, you know making components, making blades, making modules, uh, making batteries. Um, each component has a different amount of credit that it qualifies for. Um, and you get it for, um, you know, for, 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 you have to make it and sell it to an unrelated party, right? So you can't sell it to your subsidiary. You have to sell it to an unrelated party. Um, right now, there's lots of interesting negotiations going on in the market about how manufacturers and their customers share that benefit, right? Uh, and, and both of these credits qualify for direct pay. So for both of them, you can say, oh, I don't know any tax. I'm just going to go to the Treasury, the IRS, say, I don't earn any tax. Please cut me a check for 100 cents of a dollar. And, and you can do that. So it's very clear uh, that you can capture the benefit, you know, and, you know, and so then some customers are saying, oh, well, manufacturer, you're going to get this big, you know, check from the IRS, you know, so therefore I want a lower price because you're going to put this money in your pocket and that's a windfall for you. And I want a lower price. Manufacturers say, no, 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 we're just barely getting by, you know, this is saving us, you know, we, we need this. You know, you're making all this money. You know, leave us alone. Let us keep it. That's an ongoing, um, you know, that's an ongoing discussion between the manufacturers and their customers. That same relationship, though, happened between New Jersey and Orsted, right? On the ITC credits that they, the, the state of New Jersey smelled money and said, Orsted, you owe us that. And, and that's what happened in a simplistic terms, right? Okay. All right. So it sounds like it's happening even at state levels, not company to company, but even sort of. Bigger players. Everybody's making sure their counterparty is not getting a windfall and everybody else at, and also at the same time having their own hand out and saying, you know, I need this to survive, please, you know, that it's not a windfall. So everybody wants a piece of it. Okay. So uh, I want to just take it one, I guess, one level up here, which is that there's a lot of, of the details of the IRA bill that get thrown to the Treasury Department and the IRS, that they actually write the code that the manufacturers, operators, developers have to follow. And there has been a, a number of news articles from developers saying, we don't know what the IRS ruling is, so we're not really sure what the percentage is and what we're going to get. So we're still trying to get clarity there. Is Are some of these things going to become clearer in the next 6 to 12 months as uh, particularly offshore gets developed? So Treasury has done a good job meeting the timelines to get the guidance out. Um, and we now have guidance, at least proposed guidance on everything um, except for 45X, again, that manufacturing production credit we just talked about, and for hydrogen, 45D, the hydrogen credit, um, which is in a quagmire within the government because different departments within the government have different views as to whether, you know, you should be making it better for hydrogen or for renewable energy uh, project orders. So uh, there's a there's an arm wrestling match going on over that. Um, and they missed, the, they missed the statutory deadline Congress gave them for, to get those rules out. They just said they couldn't do it. Um, and they, they haven't resolved it yet. So who knows when we get that guidance. We could be tomorrow. They could, they could settle their internal disagreement or it could be, you know, years. Um, so, but that's hydrogen, which is not your, you know, uh, audience. Uh, 45X we're still waiting for. You know, the other thing we're waiting for, which does matter, particularly to offshore wind, is in 2015, so eight years ago, uh, the IRS and Treasury put out a notice saying, um, we have these really old investment tax credit regulations from the 1980s. Um, the technology has changed. The law has changed. Market practice has changed. We need to update them to reflect new technology, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so that was right at the end of the Obama administration. Um, they uh, they asked for comments. The industry sent in, you know, thoughtful, detailed comments. Um, Trump won the election. Trump said, nope, um, my IRS is not spending time on this. You know, uh, bury that in a drawer somewhere and forget about it, uh, which they did. And then Trump lost the next election when you get Biden. Biden's like, yes, I want you to do this. This is great. Please, you know, work on this. Then we get the IRA, which changes the rules again. So like, okay, we have to go back and revisit some of this and tweak some of it. We have to re rework it. Um, the IRS and Treasury are saying that we will get those regulations. They're saying informally we should get those regulations by the end of the year. But it's been eight, eight years, so, you know, who knows? <laughs> um, uh, but, but there are a number of issues uh, that are important to the offshore wind industry 
uh, pending in those regulations, and that they those will answer some questions uh, that the offshore wind developers have been holding their breath about. So, from the industry, we all need to sit here and 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 cross our fingers that we get these done before the next election cycle, so they don't get pushed off again. Yeah, it's a political football, absolutely. David, this has been really insightful. Joel and I have learned a tremendous amount uh, about tax law in the United States, which is a shocker for an engineer because that's not something we plan on doing anytime. But but it's coming up more and more in the news, and it is it's becoming a decision point for a lot of operations, particularly offshore. So this has been a real pleasure to learn some of the fundamentals here. And uh, if people that are in, invested in wind want to find out more and learn more about the, the tax law that's happening right now, particularly in the United States, how do they pull some of this information? Where can they find you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I have a blog. It's called taxequitynews.com. Um, and you can follow the blog and you can also reach me um, via LinkedIn, uh, David Burton, Norton Rose Fulbright. All right, David, thank you so much for being on the program. We would love to have you back. I feel like in six month time frame, when things get wrapped up with the IRS, we're going to need to have you back and explain what's happened <laughs> in the industry because this is this has been great. I really appreciate it. It was fun, guys. I, I enjoyed it. Good, good question. I'm impressed by your uh, your 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 uh, sophistication about the topic and your podcast sophistication. So it was great. Thanks, David. Thanks, David.